<sighs> the Ogre. Hello, and welcome to The Fourth Culture. My name is Ramji, and this is a new show we've called Myths and Monsters. My goal is to take a look at some famous or infamous D&D monsters from the Monster Manual or similar other places, perhaps some from uh, uh, other things on DM's Guild or um, other homebrew inventions people have made that are directly related towards their cultures. And then take a look at the root stories and myths of that creature and see how the D&D representation uh, matches up to that. Then my goal is to maybe spend a bit of time tweaking or modifying or creating an updated version of this that more accurately brings some of the wonderful folklore from our world into the D&D mythos. This week, as you might have guessed, we're going to look into one of the most common and arguably infamous antagonists of a good bedtime story, the fearsome ogre. This is going to be a three-part video. The first part, we'll talk about the roots of the classical fairy tale ogre and what that translates to on your D&D table in most cases. Then we'll talk about ogres in tales around the world in part two and how their counterparts are represented uh, often badly or inaccurately in Dungeons and Dragons or other role-playing games. And then finally we're going to look at taking the humble D&D ogre and making it into something a little bit more mythologically appropriate and uh, perhaps interesting. Greedy, dumb, mean. Now, in fairness and folkloristics, I think the ogre is any form of violent, stupid, powerful creature, humanoid creature, that eats flesh, and eats human flesh more specifically. Now, that doesn't tie necessarily, because often giants, such as in the story of Jack and the Beethork, are large humanoid figures that eat flesh. But I think the ogre also has a specifically meaningful role in being much closer to human beings than fantastical giants. Fantastical giants often lived in the clouds, were huge creatures, and had powerful cultures and civilizations quite often. Ogres were, and are in the stories, creatures who are a staple of the fantasy and fairy tales. And the classical Western ogre shows up a lot in fiction, but most have some very common traits. They tend to be large, gluttonous creatures with a low intellect and a penchant for violence. Me glob, me hungry, and you food. They're not fussy in what they eat, but they find that most delectable morsel, human children, the most wonderful of meals, thus setting themselves up to be the worst of villains and the best of triumphant stories when they are overcome. They are big, and they tend to follow a might-makes-right mentality, and they defer to larger, meaner creatures. They're often found in the employ of uh, more powerful, intelligent uh, creatures who treat them as their muscle. In fairy tales, uh, however, when we look back into sort of the Western European fairy tales, ogres weren't always lumbering primitives in loincloths carrying large clubs. Often, they led wicked but comfortable lives, eating children like hors d'oeuvre in their fancy castles surrounded by their wealth and trappings, expressing many of the seven deadly sins, but particularly gluttony. Sometimes they had magical powers. For example, the ogre in Puss in Boots is a great example of one who had the ability to cast spells. But usually that's the domain of other ogres in other cultures, Rakshasas and Oni and Wendigos. Ogres in Western mythology have now pretty much devolved into dumb, powerful brutes. In some cases, they are smart, powerful brutes, and they're not always the viciously evil, chaotic evil, if you will, archetype. Uh, Shrek is a good example of this. The feminine of ogre, just as a matter of curiosity, is generally given to be ogress, and the queen mother in an original telling of Sleeping Beauty, well, she was an ogress, uh, which makes Sleeping Beauty herself half ogress. But this does lead to some interesting racial purity tropes, especially given the way that ogres are often depicted. And so then there's Disney. And so, with the exception of Shrek, who is a, a lovable misanthrope with a heart of gold, 
the ogre does play the role of an excessively aggressive human, an extremity that is often used to politically characterize and demonize a universal bad, that child-eating, you know, monster uh, that uh, represents the power of might makes right. And where did the ogre word come from? And what brought about their terrible reputation as a monster? And how were they seen in other cultures? The Oxford English Dictionary defines a few possible sources of the word ogre. There is, however, still a bit of discussion online, and even in the OED, that muddles the origin a bit. The French ogre is perhaps derived from the classical Latin word orcus, a name that many D&D players will be familiar with. The name of the god of the infernal regions, also known as Hades or Pluto, the Etruscan god Orcus fed on human flesh. It's influenced by words such as bougre, an old French word for heretic, that leans back to schisms in the Catholic Church as Catharism, a persecuted sect of Christianity that was heavily influenced by Zoroastrianism in the 11th century. So the dark and brooding ogre representing a powerful, unsurmountable evil being associated with heresy in the church? Hmm. Another definition is the use of the sort of post-classical Latin word uh, of ugri or uh, ogri, uh, which I have said perhaps dubiously, uh, which is applied by uh, early writers to the Hungarian or Magyar people. Yet another example of the ogre being used to represent the other, the other part of human enough, but clearly going to eat your babies, which, you know, hey, that's not a tool for uh, political control. I don't know what is. Um, it's worth also noting that the, the, the Spanish word ogro is a borrowing from the French word ogre. Another source myth for the ogre is the English medieval story Beowulf which may be considered one of the most significant surviving works of Western medieval literature. It's about 3,000 lines of story, poetry, saga. But it can roughly be summarized as the story of a man named Beowulf who kills three monsters in the course of his life and then dies at a relatively advanced age. Grendel, the most famous of the monstrous opponents of Beowulf, is often referred to as an ogre. It's worth mentioning that at times... Grendel's referred to as a goblin or even a giant. So these words are clearly somewhat interchangeable, as we'll see a little bit later. But even so, goblin, giant, or ogre, Grendel has fangs, the ability to drink blood, crush bone, and swallow prey live. He's a merkstapper, a border stepper, a foreigner, whose eyes glow with a grim light, a descendant of Cain, the exiled murderer of the antediluvian myth, often considered the damned progenitor of vampires in our modern stories. Grendel is shaped like a man, but is much larger and lives in a gloomy underwater lair beyond the Mikan Moor, the Dark Moor. Sounds pretty damn D&D &D right now, huh? Also, Dark Moor heeds his victims, bones and all, and fights without weapons or armor in frenzied attacks that leave dozens dead in his wake. This bears some recollection to the idea of berserkers in the Norse stories. Also, um, the mentioning of the Dark Moor also brings to mind the concept of Moorishness, though I think that may post-date this a little bit. Grendel is an envious, resentful, and angry towards all mankind, Possibly because he feels that God has blessed mankind, but that he as a descendant of Cain may never be blessed. Grendel especially resents the light, joy, and music that he observes in Hrothgar's beautiful mead hall. He's protected from man's weapons by a magic charm, and he devours some of the dead on the spot and carries others back to his lair to share with his mother beneath the moor. The first night the Beowulf spends with the Skildings, Grendel stomps up from the swamp, bashes open the mead hall's door with a single tap and quickly waltz down one of the poor residents inside. Pretty grim. So, my personal theory is that the word ogre is therefore influenced by the Norse word jotun, giant, 
which is corrupted into Iotinus or Etin inside the story of Beowulf. It's considered to be one of the other races that are mentioned in the story, along with elves and Orkneys. Um, it's possible that uh, Ogre also comes from Ork and Orkneys, and we'll talk about that in a second, but the Yetins, the Orkneys, the elves, the Jotuns, and everyone else are part of the folkloric landscape of the British Isles and this part of Europe at the time, and they were often, uh, especially Yetins and Jotuns, uh, they're considered to be a thing called bogles. They're um, bogeymen, sort of uh, bog creatures. They're often used in stories to scare children and warn them away from the stupid activity of wandering around in tar bogs at night, but also uh, used in effigy to scare away creatures from the fields. Pretty fucking cool. So where did the word ogre come from? So between Beowulf and the links to the Latin orcus, we come to the Middle French orc, for meaning hell, and uh, also the Italian word orco, demon, huerco, devil, personification of death, the Sardinian word orcu, for another word for demon, and the early Dutch word orc, meaning an unruly savage. We can see that the ogre and the orc really share the same rough mythological space of being a profoundly important monster that is representative of evil, powerful forces. Humanoid, demonic, uh, a bringer of death and suffering. But it's worth pointing out that the Tolkien orc, and Tolkien was a huge, um, uh, he was an English professor, I believe, and certainly he was a, a, um, a student of English literature, especially a old English literature. And in Beowulf, Tolkien was inspired to understand that the elves existed and the orcs existed, and even the fact that Etins, which do exist in some of the other tales, existed. So the ogre itself is not, I don't believe, directly addressed much by Tolkien. I think there is a, a passing reference to ogres as being a uh, giant kin. Beyond Beowulf, though, the ogre really first appears widespread in the famous story, Hop of My Thumb, Le Petit Poussé, uh, one of eight fairy tales published by Charles Perrault. And it's a classic example of the Arn Thompson Uther trope of the small boy defeats the ogre. But the most famous ogre, of course, is the shape-changing Marquis of Caraba from Puss in Boots, who the anthropomorphic eponymous cat defeats. So, this is the Dungeons and Dragons channel. Let's talk about some Dungeons and Dragons. Let's compare and contrast the way the ogre is talked about in D&D, and you'll see that there are some common themes to explore. The simplification and dehumanization of the ogre is a brutish, giantish glutton representing a simplistic version of Grendel is pretty common in all of the versions of D&D and in the definition of the ogre. And we'll get to how to make your D&D ogre a bit more punchy in part three. But first, let's delve into what the monster manual says. Ogres are as lazy of mind as they are strong of body. They live by raiding, scavenging, and killing for food and pleasure. The average adult specimen stands between nine and 10 feet tall and weighs close to a thousand pounds. Ogres are notorious for their quick tempers, which flare at the smallest perceived offense. Insults and name-calling can rouse an ogre's wrath in an instant, as can stealing from it, bumping, jabbing, or even prodding it, laughing, making faces, or simply looking at it the wrong way. When its rage is incited, an ogre lashes out in a frustrated tantrum until it runs out of objects or creatures to smash. Ogres eat almost anything, but they especially enjoy the taste of dwarves, halflings, and elves. When they can, they combine dinner with pleasure, chasing scurrying victims around before eating them raw. If enough of its victim remains after the ogre has gorged itself, it might make a loincloth from its quarry skin and a necklace from its leftover bones. This macabre carving is the height of ogre fashion. An ogre's eyes glitter with avarice when it sees the possessions of others. Ogres carry rough sacks on their raids, which they fill with fabulous treasure taken from their victims. 
This might include a collection of battered helmets, a moldy wheel of cheese, a rough patch of animal fur fastened like a cloak, or a squealing, mud-spattered pig. The ogres also delight in the gleam of gold and silver. They will fight one another over small handfuls of coins. Smarter creatures can earn an ogre's trust by offering it gold or a weapon forged for a creature of its size. A legendary stupidity. Hmm. Few ogres can count to ten, even with their fingers in front of them. Most speak only a rudimentary form of giant and know a smattering of common words. Ogres believe what they are told and are easy to fool or confuse, but they break things they don't understand. A silver-tongued trickster who may test their talents on their savages will typically end up eating their eloquent words and then being eaten in turn. They're primitive wanderers. Ogres will clothe themselves in animal pelts and uproot trees for use as crude tools and weapons. They create stone-tipped javelins for hunting. When they establish lairs, they settle near the rural edges of civilized lands, taking advantage of poorly protected livestock, undefended larders, and unwary farmers. An ogre sleeps in caves, animal dens, or under trees until it finds a cabin or isolated farmhouse, whereupon it kills the inhabitant and lairs there. Whenever it is bored or hungry, the ogre will venture out from its lair, attacking anything that crosses its path. Only after an ogre has depleted an area of its food does it move on. Ogres sometimes band together in small nomadic groups, but they really lack a true sense of tribalism. When bands of ogres meet, one might attempt to capture the members of another group to increase its numbers. But ogre bands are just as likely to trade their members freely, especially if the welcoming band is temporarily flush with food and weapons. Whenever possible, ogres will gang up with other monsters to bully or prey on creatures weaker than themselves. They associate freely with goblinoids, orcs, and trolls, and practically worship giants. In fact, in the giant's complex social structure, known as the Ordnung, Ogres rank below the lowest of giants in status. As a result, an ogre will do nearly anything a giant asks of it. Let's talk about some crunch. The ogre is a low armor, high speed CR2 creature. This means that a group of four or five uh, relatively standard geared level two characters can expect to fight and win against an ogre. We're going to take a look at some of the maths behind that in the crunch. We're also going to talk a little bit about what an ogre can do to your party. Let's take the example of five level two fighters wielding long swords and shields with maybe 20 hit points or so um, against an ogre. If you take the starter equipment that's available to you, we use d d Beyond quite often, so pick a, a, a starter fighter, uh, give them chainmail, which they'll get, give them a shield. They kind of come out of the gate using the standard array with an AC of 19 if you if you set your stats up that way, which is pretty good, actually. Additionally, with a longsword as a melee weapon, they'll do 1d8 plus 3 points of damage, which is, you know, give or take 5.5 for a d8 plus 3, so 8.5 points of damage per hit. So we're going to break this down a little bit and talk about uh, the humans and the ogres. So human initiative has uh, an expected value of 12, meaning that they have a plus two in their initiative roll and, you know, 12 to 12.5. I'm going to start rounding down things just to make it easier. But um, uh, give or take, what that means is the attack roll, given they've got plus five to hit, is a 15. Now, an ogre's got an AC of 11, which means most of the time uh, you need to roll kind of yeah, six or more to hit which means that that's actually a 25% chance of missing. The ogre goes in the lower initiative, which means in general, uh, they won't get the chance to attack first, especially because they're not that perceptive anyway. They're not really going to pay attention to what's going around them. So as a result, they go on an initiative of nine, give or take, and an expected value for their attack roll is actually a bit better. It's 16 because ogres are, you know, they have a bit of punch to them. They're quite strong. What does that mean? Well, it means that actually though, 16 on your hit roll 
isn't going to hit that often, right? Even with a regular sort of distribution, you're actually going to miss 65% of the time and you'll hit 35% of the time, given that you've got an AC of 19 to be on your chainmail and shield wearing fighter. So five well-armed level two fighters will take down an ogre and they'll take them down in about five rounds, give or take. So that's pretty fair. That's kind of the goal, I believe, that the game balances after. Not a bad outcome to talk about. But five peasants, on the other hand, you know, who are uh, don't have necessarily the armor and they're sat at AC 10, all of a sudden now the ogre is missing, well, four times out of 20. And that's not a whole lot. That means 80% of the time that ogre's hitting. And each time that ogre hits, it's doing a lot of damage for 13 points uh, with the Grey Club. So doing 13 points of flat damage every time you hit, well, your average peasant doesn't have 13 hit points. In fact, doesn't have five hit points, I believe. So you can see that ogres are the stuff of peasant nightmare, but a band of well-armed level two fighters could be considered knights would put down an ogre. So from a narrative balance perspective, this works fine. Your, uh, your village will be terrified of an ogre. Uh, they will keep people away from them as much as possible because this thing can see in the dark, really isn't really picky, has no qualms about killing the old, the weak, the strong or otherwise, and probably not many people in the village are as strong as a level two fighter. And so the ogre becomes the ogre of nightmares, but is put down by a band of the king's knights, who, or the player characters in this case. But in the crunchy sense, however, it doesn't work because level two characters uh, tend to be quite powerful. I mean, we've just used the standard array here. So sure, you can absolutely play a very, very realistic D&D game. But if you're not playing that style and you are playing a slightly more high fantasy game, an ogre will get put down very quickly by your level two uh, party. Uh, now, of course, this is five fighters and five rangers wouldn't get the extra actions. Uh, there's a whole bunch of additional things here to consider, um, but I've not actually taken into account the action surge as part of the math below. Uh, the action surge just means you'll get it done one round quicker. But if you had five mages, okay, that might be tough, but actually five mages would still do a, a fair amount of damage and magic missile will hit every time. So uh, there's a lot of damage that comes out in uh, your uh, level two characters for a given single ogre. So I would suggest that this should be considered a relatively straightforward encounter. So there are other kinds of ogre and we can call them ogre kin if you like. Ogrillians, orogs are mentioned in the Fiend Folio way back in advanced Dungeons and Dragons times. An ogrillion is a French word for the child of an ogre. Uh, in D&D lore, interestingly enough, it is the offspring of an orc and an ogre. Uh, apparently, a female orc and a male ogre. I mean, who knew? Uh, it's worth noting, apparently, that a male orc and a female ogre will produce an orog. Okay, well, there we go. However, ogrekin are not that present in the D&D of today. In fact, in anthropology and mythology circles, as we said earlier, the word ogre is used to refer to any man-eating giant in the folklore. It does include European ogres, Arabic ghouls, Persian divs, Algonquin Bacock and Wendigo, the Japanese Oni and the Indian Rakshasa, amongst many others. Ogre Magi or Oni are long-time monsters in Dungeons and & Dragons and have been around since the 70s. As of Rakshasas, though, the Rakshasa that you see in the game bears very little relation to the Rakshasa of the stories and mythologies from the subcontinent. And as we've discussed ourselves, the Ogre itself is a creature of folklore. Uh, the Ogre Magi is also a creature of folklore, but a very different one. And is a very much a case of pretty blatant and not particularly tactful cultural appropriation. In fact, they kind of knew it at the time because they called it the Japanese ogre. So, in our next episode, we're going to take a look at some of these myths from around the world. We'll talk about different types of ogres, and we'll talk about their role inside the cultures and the stories from different parts of the world. The thing that 
I really want to leave you with, though, is that the ogre is a creature of nightmare. It's the thing that's used to scare children, and it sits deep, deep inside the psyche of all of your player characters. So don't make the ogre a dumb brute, chaff to be reaped by your players as they get stronger and stronger. Instead, imagine a world where ogres get organized, that there's a bell curve, and perhaps ogres are a little bit dumber, are a little bit more animalistic, and are a little bit more brutal on average. But hey, there's a bell curve, and some of those ogres are magicians, some of those ogres are clerics and wizards and scholars. And over time, they develop civilization. They become stronger. They collaborate. Maybe their society is based on different principles and appears to be violent and one where survival and strength is respected more than anything else. But now the ogres in your campaign start to become a little bit more Instead of fighting a single CR2 ogre, imagine five fighters fighting three CR2 ogres. All of a sudden, that's not a lopsided fight anymore. They're not going to win that. Now imagine those ogres are starting to wear plate mail. Imagine a single ogre knight wearing plate mail with an AC of 19, or even chain mail and a shield. Let's just even the balance up a bit. I tell you what, let's give our ogre a glaive and chainmail, or even a longsword and chainmail. What's our ogre going to do? Well, with that additional strength and with that additional reach, all of a sudden, that ogre is dominating that encounter. Just remember, the best monsters are the ones that surprise you. My name is Ramji. I'll see you next time.